afternoon. Uh, great to see so many of you. I think we're going to have a, a wonderful discussion on the idea of a green working waterfront and how to make it work. Uh, I'm City Council Member Brad Lander uh, from Brooklyn and very happy to be with all of you today. We've got a great uh, panel and Ed Kelly is going to serve as moderator and introduce. Um, you know, I think when some people think of the Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance and a vision for New York City's waterfronts, you know, what's, you know, first, second, third in their minds are recreational and open space uses, access to the water, the sort of natural resources. The, um, and what I think is great is that there are this many people at this conference, uh, but also the Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance and so many people here uh, really have worked very hard over a lot of years to keep the working waterfront front and center, to make sure that we're thinking about it, that we're preserving space for it, and that we're thinking about how to make it work. Uh, at the big level, we know that it's an extraordinary resource, that it's a fundamental economic resource for the competitiveness of the region, uh, that that generates good jobs, can generate good jobs for people who live here and have an opportunity to grow in an economy when that's not always possible, and that there are substantial regional environmental benefits to a working waterfront to bringing goods in by ship rather than trucking them or bringing them in some less environmentally friendly way. At the same time, we know that each of those things is difficult. The economic benefits, the jobs benefits, and the environmental benefits uh, all have their problems and challenges and sort of dark sides. Uh, all that infrastructure has to go somewhere. Uh, and so the neighborhoods that are adjacent to our working waterfront face a series of challenges uh, related to trucks, related to environmental impacts. Uh, the, the economic aspects itself are a real challenge and figuring out what it means for the region as a whole and certainly for the New York City side of the harbor uh, to be viable, to, to attract the business that it, it needs to attract, to really function in a vibrant way going forward. Uh, and the, the job side is complicated too, as we learned recently at the council, learning more about the uh, port serving trucks, uh, job quality has deteriorated uh, in some pretty significant ways. Uh, and those jobs aren't necessarily always going to local residents, and so the challenge of figuring out both how we strengthen the working waterfront and our port economically, uh, how we make sure those are good jobs, that they go to local residents, that they create career paths, and how to attend to the more localized environmental issues uh, and how communities uh, near and around the port uh, can benefit from what's taking place and not be harmed by it are all big challenges. Uh, luckily, I would say, I, from what I've seen in my time on the council and before, there are challenges that people can be invested in together and that those folks who want to see the port succeed for those economic, environmental, and jobs reasons, both invested in helping make it work and invested in addressing those challenges head on. Um, we're lucky today to have a great panel to really frame up those issues, uh, help us get into more details, think about what's going on in some other places. Uh, and look at real solutions that we can move forward with. So with that, I'm pleased to introduce Ed Kelly, who will be our moderator for today. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, I think you summed it up pretty well. The real issue that I think we're going to be addressing today is one of balance. Uh, it's kind of a yin-yang cost-benefit analysis. We have to take a look at what is the value of the working waterfront and waterborne transportation and the movement of goods and people and balance that with what is the impact on our communities, on our environment, both the air, the water, the ground, and even the, a lot of people fail to really work this into the equation, but wildlife issues, the impact even birds, right whales, things like this that are out there that are impacted by things that happen with the shipping and the international trade community. So we've got a great panel, we've got a few people coming from very different angles to take a look at this. And I think what w at the end of the day, what we'd like to kind of see you folks start going like this and realizing both what the cost and the benefit of this international transportation and domestic transportation network is. Because as we've been talking today, we've been hearing an awful lot about containers. And I, my whole career, I was in the container business. But I have to tell you, container ships represent less than half, less than half of the international deep water ships that come in and out of this port. Uh, you know, we monitor at my organization, the Maritime Association of Marine Exchange, vessel arrivals, departures, and we break this down into the type of vessel and anything that's 300 tons or greater uh, that requires a pilot, we monitor. And we found that less than half are container ships. We also have to realize that the deep draft community, 
including tankers and bulkers and all of those, are only one segment of overall what happens in this harbor of ours. We also have to take a look at the domestic aspect. This is the, primarily the tugs, the barges, the work boats that move the sand, the cement, the fuel, the heating oil. And at the end of the day, when you flush the toilet, it moves the refuse, the waste, the recyclables, etc. So the working industry really brings you the American way of life. Uh, they stopped making men's dress shirts in the United States several years ago. If anybody's got a cell phone, I challenge anybody to show me one that's made in the United States. They don't make televisions in the United States anymore. They don't make Xboxes or play games. Obviously, foreign cars are not built here. We don't have any real big oil wells right next door in New Jersey or downtown Manhattan. The fuel that heats your apartments, that enables the power stations so that you can turn on the lights, when you put on your underwear, because they don't make underwear in the United States anymore, all of this comes from an international market. So God bless, we have got a wonderful, vibrant, global international trade community, as well as a very active in this port, domestic trade activity. Most people don't realize that this is the largest petroleum port in the United States. Over 80% of the home heating oil for the new Northeast, i.e. New England, upstate New York, etc., uh, comes via this port and moves by barge and feeders moving up into those areas. We move heavy lift equipment, we move sand, construction materials. So all of this is really what we're talking about with the working waterfront. Uh, I like to say we've gotten so good at what we do that most people don't even realize we do it anymore. And that's a very important thing to realize. Uh, the working maritime infrastructure in this great port of ours affects your life every single day, multiple times a day. Check out where your shoes are made. Anybody that owns a farm-built car. I could run down the list. Toys. If anybody finds a toy that's not made in China lately, it's, it's a rarity. But I think we have to take a look at all of this. And the key is, that's a tremendous value, a benefit. And the cost is the impact we have on our living conditions, our communities, and our environment. There are existing regulations, etc., and there are a lot of voluntary programs that the industry is undertaking. We're not where we need to be yet. We are the greenest form of transportation available to move people and freight. However, we need to get greener, and I think that's a little bit of what we're going to talk about today and evaluate what those needs, benefits, and costs are. So if we could start out, we'll run right down the list. Eddie Batista will be our first speaker with the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, and I think Eddie's going to tell us a little bit about impacts on communities. Eddie? <laughs> um, I work on the executive director of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, which is a citywide coalition of community-based organizations um, from low-income communities of color, uh, organizations that have been fighting to set next year's entrepreneurial year. Next year's entrepreneurial year, uh, and these have been fighting for 20 years um, against the disproportionate uh, burden uh, of the fire uh, infrastructure. Environmental and, and economic development policies. Um, it's it's important to note that it's not an environmental justice movement and struggle is not just uh, you know a fight against stuff. We also have fought for stuff. For example, the uh, the 2003 Brownfields uh, uh, Opportunity Act uh, was in large part shaped by uh, the advocacy of the environmental justice movement. Um, the uh, 2006 uh, New York City Solid Waste Management Plan. Uh, was shaped, uh, in fact, it's the very first solid waste management plan.
block and lot numbers um, for all the SMIAs. So it's not drawn to scale, but that gives you a pretty uh, uh, accurate idea of where these SMI, uh, SMIA designations are located. There are only six significant maritime industrial areas. Um, they're in the South Bronx, Newtown Creek, and I'm, if you, I don't know, let me see if we can work this thing here. Does that work out? Oh, this is complete, okay. From, the, from top to bottom, uh, you'll see that the uh, significant uh, maritime industrial areas, SMIAs, are the South Bronx, uh, Newtown Creek, Brooklyn Navy Yard, Red Hook, Sunset Park, and the North Shore of Staten Island. Uh, all of these communities uh, have similar um, uh, socioeconomic and demographic profiles there, predominantly communities of color and or um, uh, working class communities with significant immigrant populations. Um, these, and, and what's, uh, What's, uh, what's troubling to the environmental justice movement is we both uh, support and have supported manufacturing retention policies, uh, uh, industrial development policies that are uh, sustainable in, in, in their scope and nature. A lot of our communities depend on the zoning that you'll see in manufacturing areas for the jobs, the livelihoods of a lot of thousands of people in, our, in these communities. Um, but the twin side of that is the clustering effect that you see with designations like SMIA. Uh, the Significant Maritime Industrial Area designation uh, is one of two working waterfront designations that you'll see as part of the city's waterfront revitalization program. These six X SMIA zones don't have the same protections uh, that other designated uh, working waterfront uh, parcels in the city. For example, if you're a non-SMIA working waterfront, um, and if you're, you know, if you're uh, a developer looking to build something in, in a working waterfront that's non-SMIA, uh, there, there are a handful of criteria that you have to uh, meet in terms of consistency review in order to be deemed consistent and able to, to proceed with your development in, in these working waterfronts that are non-SMIAs. So for example, uh, your application has to demonstrate you know, suitable hydraulic and site conditions, adequate and appropriate buffering from surrounding residents, uh, proximity and access to truck and railroad transportation routes, and there, there are several others, but none of these criteria are applied in the SMIA zones. In an SMIA, all you have to do is show that you're a manufacturing or industrial use and not have to once give any sort of explanation as you would in other parts of the working waterfront, how you meet these conditions and how this demonstrates consistency. Um, we're still in the in preliminary stages of researching. Um, we don't know uh, how many SMIA applications have been uh, reviewed uh, over the last 10 years. We don't know how many have been rejected. Um, but it, it's, it's troubling to say the least that there's an actual city policy that encourages clustering and concentrations of infrastructure, in many cases polluting infrastructure, in the same handful of communities that have some of the most challenging environmental and public health problems uh, in New York City. Um, the next slide, and to kind of further uh, show why it's troubling, this next slide shows uh, the SMIA zones, and frankly, all, all, you know, all parts of the New York City waterfront, that is uh, it, by the New York State Department of Environmental, uh, New York State Office of Emergency Management, which are the areas of New York City's waterfronts that are in uh, storm surge zones. So you'll see that in each one of the SMIA zones, uh, South Bronx, Newtown Creek, et cetera, all of them are also in storm surge zones. So you have uh, this kind of twin uh, um, dynamic of the clustering uh, and concentrations of heavy industrial uh, and manufacturing activity, um, you know, uh, firms that have all sorts of, you know, chemical and, and petrochemical uh, storage and um, uh, uh, brownfield remediation and a host of city and state environmental permits clustered in the same communities that, for example, if you look at uh, Sunset Park, uh, Sunset Park is an SMIA zone where in the next 10 years there's a 90% chance uh, of, of a storm surge. Um, this is uh, troubling on multiple levels, uh, not just for the communities that are SMIA zones, but frankly the neighboring communities. In the event of a storm surge, um, what, what exactly are local residents going to be exposed to? Uh, what are the, um, you know, 
climate adaptation strategies that the city and private sector are pursuing to, to safeguard these communities. Uh, we've been in conversation with the Department of City Planning and uh, EDC, and uh, they've been um, open to uh, a dialogue. And we think it's it's and to be fair uh, to the city, it's you know this, these are all new issues. The issue of climate adaptation, community resiliency, uh, are issues that cities, waterfront cities across you know the world are, are trying to grapple with. Um, so you know to the city's credit, they've. Uh, recognize that there's a need to engage um, a lot of the communities that are uh, SMIA host communities. Uh, but, you know, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll just end by saying that um, as we look at the notion of environmental justice and the fact that there are communities that clearly um, have a disproportionate environmental burden, if you layer on to that, um, you know, issues of sea level rise and climate adaptation, uh, it's a really troubling uh, uh, scenario. And I think it's one where, you know, there's a range of, of remedies that we need to explore, everything from um, working with, with companies in these SMIA zones to find out what their disaster mitigation plans are, what are their, uh, uh, you know, chemical storage, you know, uh, policies, what are the, uh, uh, everything from, you know, engaging directly with local businesses to lobbying the federal government to change insurance uh, laws to make sure that there's uh, an incentivizing um, uh, component of insurance laws where if a company shows that they have a climate adaptation plan maybe their premiums are you know are, are lowered so th there's a need to kind of tie insurance policies so there's a range of, of public policy remedies that we believe uh, is ripe for for a public debate Thank you, Eddie. Uh, if we can, we'll move across to Maria Boyle, Freight and Maritime Program at Rutgers University of New Jersey. Uh, thank you. I'm Maria Boyle. I'm co-director of the Freight and Maritime Program at uh, Rutgers University. Um, I was the director of the program until something happened. Uh, I have an academic background and uh, I worked in academia for 15 years. And uh, I visited one of the terminals once uh, to explain to them how wonderful research we're doing, developing our online real-time dynamic and stochastic optimization models that can help them with uh, what they're doing uh, every day. And uh, one of the executives turned around and he said, plain English, Maria, please. So then uh, I decided that I need, uh, you know, to learn uh, their language, and uh, I went about and I hired my co-director from the industry, and we worked together for several years, and uh, I believe that uh, we are now in the program at the point that we do speak the language of the industry and we do understand the issues, uh, and we don't sit, uh, you know, on the ivory tower doing our models only. So what I would like to uh, present today is um, research uh, that uh, we're doing within uh, the program and how this can support uh, efforts on uh, working waterfront issues. So uh, this is part of the MWA report on working waterfront, and uh, there are four main issues that are highlighted in this report. Uh, I will focus on the second one primarily, the lack of coordinated planning. Uh, the report goes about to identify uh, ways of uh, um, addressing uh, these issues and uh, the needs, including uh, the need to make strategic investments today so that we have in place the infrastructure that we need in the future, uh, the need uh, for um, active participation of all stakeholders and coordination of their activities, uh, the need to study the system as a system using a systemic approach and looking at the whole network instead of uh, focusing on uh, components or uh, subsystems. Uh, and um, to go a little bit beyond the typical goals of uh, saving uh, money and time and look at other issues such as the um, environmental aspects as well. So uh, research to support decision making and uh, cultivate cooperation can focus on building a systemic approach and application. Our work focuses on building models that can assist decision making and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, in a minute. 
Uh, we have built a framework in which we can model both capital and operational improvements. Typically, uh, in uh, the uh, planning modeling work, these are done separately. Our framework can bring both together and evaluate them on uh, the same basis. Uh, we try to quantify the benefits and the impacts of implementing uh, several strategies uh, or combination of strategies and try to quantify the impact by stakeholder. Uh, so this way, you know, uh, the shared benefit can become a little bit more transparent in discussions and quantify economic, environmental and social benefits in the process. Uh, this is the uh, slide I used to uh, confuse people in the past. This is the one. Uh, but basically, that, uh, that, that, that's the winning slide that gave us a project at the National Science Foundation, so I keep using it. Uh, it shows how different stakeholders come together and uh, um, how um, planning and simulation tools can uh, produce some numbers that can uh, open the dialogue and, and uh, facilitate that uh, sharing uh, in the decision-making process. I won't go through this slide in detail unless you ask me afterwards, uh, but it basically shows how information flows and what are the information needs among different stakeholders. So that was part of a, a three-year grant that we received through the National Science Foundation to study operations um, at uh, terminals and port-related <laughs> ones. Uh, and um, this is the approach that we followed in studying these, uh, these issues. Some of them are, um, have very localized impacts and uh, we looked at a very uh, local level. Here you see the Newark Elizabeth Marine Terminal Network. Uh, some activities or improvements that you make on that network propagate to the other system at this level or at the regional network. So we built an integrated approach that we can study uh, potential improvements. Uh, here you see uh, a slide that I borrowed from uh, the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey. I kind of uh, distorted it a little bit so they don't say that I stole it from them. Uh, although I referenced. <laughs> so basically they use a three-tiered approach. They call a tier one system uh, the activity that takes place within terminals. They call a tier two system the drayage operations, the movement of uh, cargo, primarily containers, from the terminals to what they call a first point of rest. And uh, then from, uh, from those inland facilities into the distribution network, uh, where goods move um, using domestic trucks. What uh, our program is doing is developing uh, optimization and simulation that uh, can map the operations to, to the extent possible uh, and uh, try to uh, give like, uh, to build what if scenarios and give answers as to how things may look like if certain improvements are being implemented. So in a tier one system, we look at uh, what happens inside terminals. We have models of uh, gate operations, the birth planning applications, the yard planning applications. Then we look how this translates into activity on a network. Um, so the track movement, the dray track movement uh, on the tier two network. And uh, we have also looked into the development of freight villages, uh, and uh, some of you may have uh, heard uh, about the study um, and our results so far, uh, how this can help uh, freight processes in our region um, reduce VMTs, reduce the number of trucks, uh, dedicated corridors, uh, how track restrictions may help uh, neighborhoods, um, roadway expansion and uh, the impact, and the impact also of information-based technologies like a virtual container yard system. And I can talk about that for the next hour, but uh, I won't. Uh, but uh, I can, if you're interested, uh, I can give you more information on that later on. Uh, what I would like to say, uh, closing my presentation, is that uh, uh, today there is a focus on estimating beyond the uh, monetary and time benefit uh, in logistics and uh, uh, transportation operations, the environmental footprint. And this is at the forefront of research to internalize the environmental cost. So far it has been treated as a byproduct. Let's optimize, improve the operations, and if we have an benefit to the environment, that's good. Uh, if not, let's see what we can do about that. Now the uh, idea is that we internalize that and we try to optimize the uh, carbon um, footprint or the environmental footprint, I would say, of, uh, of the processes. Um, and uh, with that, I close my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Maria.
We'll now introduce Mr. Joe Curto, President of New York Shipping Association. Thank you, Ed. As you may know, the uh, New York Shipping Association is an association of ocean carriers, marine terminal operators, stevedores, and maritime support industries. Uh, for the past eight or nine years, we've had a fairly active <coughs> environmental agenda, an agenda that's been designed to help improve air and water quality by working with our members, the ocean carriers and terminal operators, to change their operations. And I have a PowerPoint presentation to give you some idea of what we've been up to for the past uh, eight or nine years. Um, the New York Shipping Association began to uh, develop its air quality strategy back in 2002 when we hired a couple of uh, nationally known consultants and we did some work with the Center for Clean Air Policy in uh, Washington, D.C. We produced our first air quality study in uh, April of 2004. We installed a voluntary ad, ad, uh, emissions reduction program that we presented to the uh, New Jersey DEP in 2005. We published a uh, pretty extensive environmental policy statement. And we did some things to uh, help encourage uh, more use of rail and barges to get trucks off the roadways. We supported the Albany Barge, which was an adventure to um, transfer cargo from the Port of New York to the Port of Albany, uh, replacing trucks. And we invested some $40 million by reducing assessments on um, a rail incentive program designed to uh, promote more cargo uh, out of the port by rail uh, versus truck. Uh, back in 2007, we filed a petition to establish a discussion agreement amongst the terminal operators. We had to file an agreement so we wouldn't get in trouble uh, with any uh, antitrust issues. Uh, the form permits the terminal operators to talk amongst themselves about different ideas, different things that they can do to achieve some of the goals that we set forth for environmental improvement. Uh, we created a uh, carriers, ocean carriers environmental committee. We worked very hard with the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey on their clean air strategy plan. We did a number of various things to support IMO regulations, uh, which had some um, impact on North America uh, emissions control areas and so on. Our board um, unanimously uh, voted to support the Port Authority clean air strategy. And in 2009, the New York Shipping Association was recognized by US EPA Region 2 with the highest honor that can be given to business, the Environmental Quality Award. In 2001, uh, we had a baseline report that said that associated port activities contributed about 7% of all the emissions in the northern New Jersey airshed area, which, was a, which is a, a non-attainment area. In 2004, uh, uh, another report, follow-up report, <coughs> reflected significant reductions in emissions as a result of a number of mitigating factors that we did. <clears throat> uh, today, the terminal operators, operations, and vessel operations constitute about 1% of the emissions in the northern New Jersey airshed <coughs> area. Uh, what else have we done? We've uh, gotten our ocean carrier members to sign up for the green flag program, uh, which includes um, vessel speed reductions and the use of alternative fuels when the vessels are in port. We're working with the terminal operators to sponsor pilot projects to test different types of uh, environmentally friendly uh, container handling equipment. Uh, we worked with the Port Authority and the folks in Red Hook to replace the engines on two of their old diesel cranes, and we replaced the engines on two mobile uh, cranes in Port Newark um, with new uh, modern equipment. Um, we worked with terminal operators to decommission several of the uh, diesel cranes that are in the port of New York, and we um, work with them to also electrify a number of the cranes. There are still a few diesel cranes in the port that we, uh, we want to either convert to electric or, uh, or uh, decommission. We work with the terminal operators to upgrade container handling equipment. Uh, some of the equipment's been replaced with um, uh, new power, diesel electric, hydraulic electric, and a, a CNG. Um, 
and we worked with the terminal operators to install an idle reduction plan uh, by implementing um, special equipment on the machines that would turn them off once they idled more than seven or eight minutes. These automatic shutdown devices turn the machines off so they're not running and idling, um, uh, sitting there doing nothing. Um, as part of our continuing um, commitment, we, uh, we are still encouraging the rest of our uh, ocean carrier members to uh, participate in the speed reduction plan and use the alternative fuels. Um, we're encouraging the marine terminal operators to participate in uh, pilot projects to test new equipment. As I mentioned a moment ago, we still have some uh, diesel cranes that we need to replace. Uh, we've convinced all of our marine terminal operators to convert to ultra-low sulfur fuel for all of their vehicles. I don't believe there are any today that are operating with uh, anything other than ultra-low fuel. Um, the mandatory idling um, reduction plan that we put in place is uh, working very well. And we're doing some other things like uh, working on uh, truck appointment systems to help reduce uh, truck dwell times and queue times. Um, we work with terminal operators to open additional gates to help improve truck turn times. And there are some terminals that have agreed to extending operational uh, hours of the gates to help also reduce uh, queue times to trucks. So those are the things that we've been working on. Um, we've made some improvement. We know we have a long way to go. Uh, but we have some great cooperation by the marine terminal operators and some good cooperation by the uh, vessel operators who are also members of our association. Edward? Thank you, Joan. It's particularly gratifying to note that these are predominantly voluntary programs that the industry is undertaking by itself. Uh, many of these programs are in line with what's going on in other ports and around the world and in, throughout the country. So I, w I think the terminal operators, vessel operators are also out there. Uh, speaking for the tugs and some of the ferries, they're also operating on low sulfur fuels uh, here in the port areas. And there are a host, if anybody really wants to take a look, of uh, actual regulations governing emissions and operations, including on an international basis. Uh, the MARPOL 6, which is coming up 2012, is the upgraded vessel general permit, which regulates discharges from the vessels as well as exchanges of ballast water. Uh, and also, as I said, we also keep an eye out for wildlife. Uh, there is a right whale protection program that requires mandatory slowdowns. Uh, avoidance of certain areas and reporting so that those whales, there's only 300 and some odd of them, continue to uh, have a good time in the water. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you again, Joe. And we'll move across to Andrew Gen, VP of uh, the New York City Economic Development Corporation, to give us an example of one of the productive uh, uses that the waterfront property has gone for for water dependent and eliminating a lot of trucks. Yep, that's right. Thank you, Ed. And, uh, before I get started, I wanted to really acknowledge what MWA has done here today. I mean, this is, um, we've been doing these conferences for a long time, and uh, we, few of us in the, in the audience, including myself, remember when this was just a, uh, you know, a, a gleam in the eye of the uh, Municipal uh, Arts Society, uh, you know, to create this organization. And I think that every year the conversation becomes more and more sophisticated, more and more nuanced, and it really, it kind of blows my mind to see, you know, Eddie uh, sitting uh, next to Joe Curto, who, you know, in the past, it was, it was not always easy to have, uh, you know, everybody at the table and, uh, and in the audience, and it's, uh, and it's, really, it's really wonderful to see. So, uh, so kudos to Roland and his team. So, uh, so my talk uh, is kind of riffing off of uh, the, the teaser for this panel, which was jobs, jobs, jobs. So I've got uh, jobs cubed. Port commerce, environmental betterment, community relationships. It's a lot, but it's, uh, it's kind of what we do at EDC and who we are at EDC. You probably, you've heard a lot about us already today, but we're the mini port authority for the city of New York. Uh, and, uh, you know, w with under a contract with the city, we are in charge of the city's maritime facilities. Uh, rail freight facilities and the ferries and, uh, and, and even the heliports and the airports. Yeah. And uh, you've probably heard a lot about this as well, how big and important uh, the, uh, the Port of New York and New Jersey is uh, to the region. Again, this is also a much more sophisticated conversation that we've had, uh, you know, where New York City is really recognizing how important it is, uh, you know, uh, to have a working port. We're actually a coastal city 
uh, where people work on the waterfront and uh, all of these things, uh, all the good things that come from it, uh, you know, are, are, are certainly recognized and going to be recognized more in the comprehensive waterfront plan. And these are our main facilities. We're just, uh, you know, quick, you probably heard this as well. Um, whoops. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, where's the red thing? Oh, that's it. Yeah, the easy one, right? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so our world begins uh, with New York Container Terminal, which is the largest container terminal uh, in New York City and in New York State. Uh, doing about 18% about of all total port volume. Um, and we also then have the Red Hook Container Terminal, which is the smallest uh, in New York State, um, which does about 3% uh, uh, of the volume of the port. Uh, and, and the little gleam in the eye and the dream is to reactivate the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, which is in Sunset Park, which is in Eddie's Hood. Right. <laughs> and Uprose, and that's right, and, and, and Elizabeth, more important, that's right. Okay. I, I'm in trouble now, okay. Yeah. All right. And the, Brad that's right, that's right, in his district, exactly. <laughs> Uh, the um, maritime facilities uh, in New York are very important. You can see sort of this breakdown, $40 billion worth of exports, which is, uh, which is a lot, uh, uh, $140 billion, so times 10, uh, you know, gets us uh, the value of the imports. Um, and as we've said before, it's, it's green transportation. We calculated that, uh, uh, that we have saved uh, through this means of transportation uh, 60 million uh, tons of, uh, of air emissions and 7 million gallons of, uh, of fuel because we have goods coming into the port by water. Uh, it also supports uh, almost 32,000 jobs and uh, $7 billion uh, in revenues. Uh, and uh, over a billion dollars in taxes. So it's a, it's, it's a f important, you know, this is just on the New York side of the harbor and obviously uh, uh, the many times greater if you look at the region as a whole. Um, and as, uh, as someone said before, we got our facts straight, less than 7% of the uh, regional truck moves. So it's not, it's, it's, it's generally a good neighbor. And um, my case study is really looking at Red Hook and what do we do with our, our smallest uh, marine terminal. Um, it's, uh, as I said, about 2% of the total port volume, uh, about 45,000 uh, container lifts. Uh, supports a, it supports about 220 jobs, and uh, it's uh, you know, mostly an automated operation, and it relies on a barge service uh, to Port Newark in order for it to be successful. So here's our little animation just to show you the ship comes into Red Hook, the containers get offloaded at the port. 90%, sometimes in a good year it's about 80%, then go to a, a satellite facility in Port Newark. Uh, and then what we found out through research is that 20% of the boxes come back, come back by truck across uh, the bridges and tunnels. So. Not, not the best model in, in the world uh, for a port. We love it dearly, don't get me wrong, but not the best model for a uh, successful port and, not, and, and certainly could do better as jobs. So this is my, this is the big takeaway slide. Everything after this is gravy because uh, you know, what, what, what we're doing at EDC is really trying to change the paradigm of how shipping takes place in New York. And uh, my button works here. So, we have limited space in New York City. New York City, it's a, it's a tough place to do a port business because we've got a lot of competing land uses and uh, not a lot of space. That's why containerization moved uh, to, uh, to Newark Bay back in the 1960s, so beginning really in the 1950s. Uh, we didn't have the space. But what's changed, and it, and it really is a change, is the cost of fuel, the cost of tolls, just the, the cost of, of relying on the interstate highway system to move our stuff around, and, uh, and also the higher environmental cost that that, uh, that puts onto the, the whole system, and that we, we bear that cost. And we're starting to, I think, realize that this is a, a less than sustainable uh, option for the city and for our communities. Um, we also have, you know, unique restrictions in New York, and uh, that is uh, we, we regulate pretty strictly the kinds of trucks that can come into the city. There's no trucker in the United States wants to drive in New York City streets. Uh, we ban 53-foot trucks. We ban overweight trucks. 
uh, and we love to uh, we love to um, uh, to catch them. And so trucks try to stay out of New York. So what we're working on at EDC is a new a new system. I say a new paradigm where we use the uh, port facilities that we have to get uh, the cargo in by water. And, uh, and here's where you start the layering. And uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's very fortuitous that in recent, in recent, just in recent years, the EPA has mandated the use of low sulfur uh, fuels uh, that uh, going beyond the voluntary restrictions, there's going to be in 2012 a 60% reduction in sulfur content to marine, uh, marine fuels. In 2015, that goes to a 90% restriction. So, uh, so the, the, sh the vessels, even though they're 10 times more efficient and greenhouse gas level than any other mode of transportation, they're going to get even better. It's kind of like the situation where we went from you know, the two-stroke diesel buses to the hybrid buses. So we made a good thing better, and we would do that in maritime. Uh, same thing on the marine terminals, which uh, is what Joe Curto said very, very well. I'm not going to beat that. Um, the, the marine terminal operators you know, are, are doing their part to uh, green uh, all of their facilities, the yard equipment, the cranes, and everything else. Um, and then what we, what we can do as EDC is then add additional mandates when we do leases or when we do uh, financial incentives for port uh, activity uh, on our shores, and that is to mandate cleaner, uh, cleaner vehicles um, for the uh, last mile, for the trucks that go to the to our, to our favorite, uh, and I should shamelessly plug Fairway, but you know, you'll see me there every Sunday morning uh, doing my shopping. So. so that's our new paradigm. And this is, as I said, this is, um, you know, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do Ed one better. You know, one thing, we do make pretty good beer in New York City, but we also drink a lot of imported beer. And uh, I'll also say that my, I still have a Hathaway shirt that was made in the United States. It's my proudest possession, and it's 10 years old, or plus, and it still works. So uh, Time for a new shirt. I know, I know, that's what my wife says, right. So, uh, but, <laughs> but one thing we've also learned in New York City is that we drink a heck of a lot of beer, and, and uh, you know, Heineken uh, is one of the, uh, the largest importers. I think it's the eighth largest importer in the United States, and uh, what we were uh, fortunate was um, beginning in 2002, we had a company that distributes the Heineken that wanted to get into a port facility so that they could redirect, actually redirect ships from Europe to come to Brooklyn so that they could offload their overweight containers, and put them, strip them in a warehouse, and then distribute them to the local uh, market. And so, uh, la uh, actually, last year, uh, really with um, uh, you know a, a big effort led by Venetia Lannan, we negotiated a uh, long-term lease with this company called Phoenix Beverages to Pier 11 in uh, Atlantic Basin and the Port Authority did a similar lease at Pier 7 at, uh, the Atlant at, up at uh, Atlantic Avenue. And uh, under this paradigm, what happens is uh, the Phoenix, uh, Phoenix has redirected two shipping lines to Brooklyn. They are unloading about 10,000 containers a year that are all being handled within New York City, within Brooklyn, and going to uh, the local markets. And um, this, is a, uh, this is a big change for us. We mandated that Phoenix would, have, uh, would uh, change their fleet of trucks, about 80 trucks, from uh, actually ultra-low sulfur diesel to uh, compressed natural gas, and they'll put in a CNG fueling station. Um, and at the same time, this is, this is sort of, the, again, the, the benefit. They increased the port activity in Red Hook by 20%. They introduced 400 jobs into Red Hook that are retained in New York City. They've just moved from Queens. And they'll be creating a, an additional 100 jobs. And so far, since April, we've hired, or Phoenix has hired 40 new employees. They're all Brooklyn residents hired through the local development corporation. So. That's our, and there's the new trucks, and they also distribute for Brooklyn Brewery, so uh, that's nice. And some, and some of the Brooklyn Brewery actually goes back to uh, to Holland, uh, you know, via Red Hook, which is a nice thing. And those are the reductions. But one, one more thing, we had a challenge here. This is this is where it gets really gnarly in New York City, is we've got. We had a, a, a construction project going on um, that r resulted in the closure of this truck route. So this is, um, this is Atlantic Basin, this is Pier 7, and what happens is after the trucks make their runs, they drop off their recyclables at Pier 11. 